Good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Karen Immergut. I'm a, a circuit court judge, which is a state trial court judge in the state of Oregon, where uh, we currently have a moratorium on the death penalty. Uh, <laughs> The, uh, so welcome to our panel on the death penalty, a little something uplifting to start your Saturday morning with. Uh, the purpose of this panel is to hopefully have a conversation about uh, the politics, the morality, and uh, the practical aspects of the death penalty. Uh, again, I as a state court judge, I do preside over death penalty cases, but it is the jury that decides death, uh, and it's sort of anybody's guess then what ha is, will happen if they actually do get death because they sit on death row and we don't allow death right now in Oregon. Uh, I'm joined here by some, three of the uh, foremost experts really on death penalty uh, policy and practice uh, here. And uh, I think the goal for me today is simply to make sure that Professor Serrett uh, does not uh, <laughs> take us over the time because we'll be competing with uh, <laughs> Biddy Martin. So we, we do have to stop on time. Uh, the structure for our panel is, I, I will... <laughs> so I will, I will briefly introduce our panelists, but just to let you know that uh, we're going to start with five, minute, uh, from each of, five minutes from each of them to talk a little bit about their work related to the death penalty. Then I will pose questions of them and we'll try to, you know, if, if, hopefully I won't be rude, but I may have to cut them off at some point with those questions so we can get through a variety of topics. We will reserve 10 minutes for questions from the audience at the end, uh, so save your burning questions towards the end. But we do want enough time for questions, and again, keep those questions brief. And then each of the panelists will have a very short opportunity for some closing remarks. Uh, so starting with uh, Joe Hartzler, whose uh, this panel was his idea, so he'll talk a little bit about that. He is Amherst class of 1972. He's been a long time assistant U.S. attorney, and he was the a lead prosecutor appointed by Attorney General Janet Reno to litigate the uh, t Timothy McVeigh or the Oklahoma City bombing case in which uh, scores of people were injured, but it included also, uh, as you probably all know, um, 19 children were killed and 149 adults. Uh, so Joe has actually litigated a death penalty case and he'll tell you a little bit about that. Uh, Sandy Rosenberg is also from that same class at Amherst and Columbia Law School. Uh, served in, has served in the Maryland House of uh, Delegates since 1983, and he was instrumental in repealing the death penalty in Maryland, and he'll talk about that. And uh, perhaps Professor Serrett uh, doesn't need any introduction at all, and in fact his bio is uh, so lengthy uh, and has so many accolades, uh, including that he is a beloved professor at Amherst. Um, most of us have probably had a class or two uh, with him, and he is really perhaps the foremost scholar on death penalty policy in the world. So he's world acknowledged, and with that, I'll have uh, Joe Hartzler give his five minutes. About a year ago, Sandy Rosenberg, my classmate, contacted me and asked me if I'd be interested in participating in a panel on the death penalty, and I had at least four reasons for having absolutely no interest in doing it whatsoever. One is that Karen and I and Lee Richards were on a program uh, five years ago, and we filled the room, and I thought, death penalty, there won't be six people that will show up for that. So I feel good about the size of the audience. Thank you for joining us. The other reason is that Sandy, of course, is an ardent opponent of the death penalty. He was a floor leader in Maryland to abolish the death penalty successfully. And uh, you know, who am I by comparison? So he's a heavyweight. I was going up against a heavyweight. And then the real reason was I didn't plan on coming to the 45th reunion. I didn't think I would be here. but. Um, Rather than just uh, uh, crush Sandy's enthusiasm for this topic, I made the classic chumps mistake. I said, let me think about it. The next guy, time I got on my personal email, I, there was a, a message from Sandy copying me to the reunion program chair saying, quote, Joe Hartzer and I are thinking about putting a program <laughs> That's how I got the bill passed. Yeah. So you, you can imagine overnight I've become a co-sponsor of a program that I didn't plan to attend. <laughs> but here I am. Uh, I thought that was, you know, okay, fine. I'll, I'll still be considering. I can, I can skate out at the last minute or later. And Sandy contacted me again and he said, 
he was thinking about having Austin Surratt be the moderator. Now, S Sandy is a heavyweight in this area. I'm not. If Sandy's a heavyweight, Austin, of course, is humongous. And I thought, Austin is going to be the moderator. This is going to be a heavyweight against a no weight. And the referee is going to be Sandy's trainer. How fair will this be? Well, I wasn't that much of a chump. So I said, hold on, hold on. Let's see if we can find somebody neutral. And I just happen to know a judge who is ethically bound to not espouse views on issues that might come before her. So I contact, contacted Karen. And that's why she thinks I started this program. It was all Sandy's idea. <laughs> but, but of course, I won that battle, as you can see. But I lost the war. Because what it did is it then moved Austin onto the panel. So I've now got two of these guys against my view, I'm the only proponent of the death penalty on, the, on this panel. But I had an ace in the hole, okay? My son, Matt, took a course from uh, Professor Sarrett you know, several years ago, and I thought, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do a little discovery. I'm gonna find out his weaknesses. I'm gonna really you know, scope the guy out. I called up, I called up Matt, I, I said, I began to tell him about this program. It's gonna be uh, Sandy Rosenberg, Austin Sarrett, and Matt said, hold it, Dad, hold it. <laughs> You do not want to debate, <laughs> Professor Sarah. I said, why is that? Dad, you'll lose. <laughs> so with, with that note of encouragement, <laughs> I, I'm here with uh, boosted self-confidence. OK, the sum total, you can, let's count the number of cases that I've had involving the, the death penalty in my 30 plus years as a federal prosecutor, OK? You don't need a calculator. You don't need a hand. You need one finger. I've done one death penalty case, a McVeigh case. Admittedly, it was, a, it was you know, a big case. But the sum total of my death penalty experience is a McVeigh case, and I read Austin's book, which is quite good, by the way. So that's it. I will defer to Austin regarding his book. I'll tell you very briefly about the, the McVeigh case. It involved a guy who drove a truck carrying two tons of ammonium nitrate uh, explosive in front of the federal building, lit the fuse, ran away uh, to a getaway car wearing eardrums in his ears so he wouldn't be, so he'd be protected from the, uh, the, from the blast. It tore down a third of the front of the building, nine stories of concrete, pancaked down on top of uh, people killing 168 people, and 75 miles away, 75 minutes later, he was arrested on unrelated charges. Two days later, remained in custody for two days later when the federal authorities realized that McVeigh was connected to the, to the bombing. So obviously had, you know, no alibi. And, and many of you will remember the sort of the pic picture from the perp walk, perp, perp walk when he had the orange. I, I see nods in the audience. We made the cover of Newsweek magazine. Part I remember about that is the audio from the video of the perp, perp walk. The, there were vicious dogs barking in the background. I do not think these were police dogs, but they sounded like those Doberman Pinschers or, or uh, German Shepherds or something, ferociously barking and people shouting, baby killer, monster. I thought, whoa, 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 this is coming on the heels of, you know, some perception of fallibility of the justice system as a result of, one, the acquittal of the police officer in the Rodney King case, two, the, remember the Menendez brothers in California, the shotgun, there was a mistrial in that case where they killed their parents. And then three, of course, the O.J. Simpson case, which a lot of people viewed as, as just a circus trial. And, and I thought, well, this is not a case that should, one, have a defendant that gets railroaded just because people hate him. And plus, it's an opportunity to potentially restore some dignity to the justice system. So we really tried to keep everything out of the news. We tried to try the case in court. We did it very quickly. I mean, it took two years to get there, but once we got started in the trial, it ran very sw swiftly. And, and I think that justice was achieved. My role as a federal prosecutor was to enforce the law. And I thought the law in this case demanded the death penalty. So the question is, do I have any qualms about seeking and striving for the death penalty for Timothy McVeigh? The answer is no. Sandy? Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Uh, one of my nicknames when I was an undergraduate was Slim. <laughs> so this is the very first time that I've been called a heavyweight. <laughs> uh, in my day, in our day, a heavyweight was Muhammad Ali. Um, but Joe, for me, 
and for many other people in our class and for many other people in this country, when you brought that, when you prosecuted that case, you were a hero. So thank you. Um, <laughs> at some point in my legislative career, I decided that I was against the death penalty because too much time and effort was spent on a handful of cases, both in the courts and in the legislative process, at the expense of other criminal justice issues, and that therefore we should, I would support the death penalty, the repeal of the death penalty if the opportunity arose. And then in 2006, we elected a Democratic governor, Martin O'Malley, and that fall, I was at a press event for MedCai, the medical chirurgical faculty, and the lobbyist for MedCai, Jay Schwartz, came up to me afterwards and said, there's going to be an effort, uh, a significant effort, to uh, repeal the death penalty, and we would like you to be the lead sponsor in the House. And as Jay told me later, the pitch he made to the, this coalition was, Sandy works his bills. And so for the next six years, six, seven years, we worked the bill. But one of my first thoughts was, well, we'll be very involved, the Catholic Conference will be very involved in this issue, uh, historically, and in fact, they were. And we had just completed a session where we had gone, some pretty serious disagreement between myself and the lobbyists for the Catholic Conference about whether the state should fund embryonic stem cell research. And I said to the lobbyist Schwartz, uh, who's a Notre Dame graduate, he's, he's not Jewish, uh, I said, I need an apology from the lobbyist for the Catholic Conference, uh, Dick Dowling, before I can sit down at the table with him and work on this bill. And he did get a written apology, I think as Lillian Hellman once said of Mary McCarthy, or was the other way around, Every word in it, including the, was false. But we agreed. We worked together for the next six, seven years. He retired, actually, by the time we passed the bill. But one of the first people I called after we passed the bill was Dick Dowling to tell him that we had accomplished this. And I would just conclude, that says something about the power of this issue says something about the legislative process that somebody can be your enemy one day and your friend another, the next. Uh, but this is the most profound thing I will ever do. And I, it has a great meaning to me to be able to discuss it today in this place with you. Thank you. So um, I, I want to talk to you about uh, why I think that uh, Amherst students should study the death penalty. Uh, I've not litigated any death penalty cases. Uh, I've done a fair bit of scholarship on the death penalty, but I want to engage in a little bit of a conversation about why the issue of the death penalty is uh, an educationally relevant one. So you come with me on a little bit of a journey back to Amherst? Uh, by the way, with that response, I feel like I'm back in my own classroom. So let's try that again. Will you come with me a little bit of journey back there? That's much better. For five minutes. <laughs> very good, Judge. So, uh, by the way, may I just tell you a very quick story? So when I went to law school, which was 10 years after I started teaching at Amherst, so I went back to law school after I started to teach here, I did a little bit of clinical work and then I think my first or second effort, which was a TRO, the TRO was denied. And as soon as the judge denied the TRO, I began to rise to argue with the judge. And the supervising attorney grabbed my uh, back of my blazer and said, sit down, you're not in your own classroom anymore. So I'm not gonna argue with the judge. So in five minutes, <laughs> so, um, can I ask one of my favorite students a question? Fine, thank you, Judge. <laughs> Emily, what does it mean to say that someone deserves something? It's something. Um, you have to talk loud because the people aren't here. Uh, if they deserve it, it means that they sort of have it coming. That there's, that there's something about them that acts or whatever they're about to do. 
fabulous, that there's something about them that asks for or demands what they're about to get. For me, the issue of the death penalty is a, a kind of a lever, a kind of wedge issue, which allows me to talk to students about a variety of things that I think are central to uh, the education of people in the liberal arts. One of them is I'm interested in the con connection between morality and law. And I'm interested in the death penalty because I'm interested in whether or not it is possible to say Timothy McVeigh deserved the death penalty. We shouldn't give it to him. That statement helps students begin to think about what is the difference between a moral argument or a moral intuition and a legal process or a legal, a, a legal result. So the death penalty, conversation about the death penalty helps me get students in a place where, where there's a very material issue, but I can get them to think about what is the difference between the statement someone deserves something and we're not going to give it to them. Second, talking about the death penalty allows me to talk about my favorite constitutional amendment. You all have one, don't you? Mine is the Eighth Amendment. The Eighth Amendment more clearly, I believe, than any other amendment to the Constitution of the United States, expresses the distinctive temper of the American commitment to the rule of law. So there's a lot at stake in this conversation. Why do I say that? The Fourth Amendment protects the innocent. The Fifth Amendment protects the innocent. The Sixth Amendment protects the innocent. The Eighth Amendment protects the guilty. The commitment that our punishments not be cruel is an expression, I think, in its clearest form of the American commitment to restraint in the use of government power. So first, the distinction between morality and law. Second, talking about the death penalty enables me to get students to think about what is distinctive about the American idea of the rule of law. And third, last but not least, talking about the American death penalty allows me to work with students to actually understand how the criminal justice system in the United States works. So away from abstraction to close observation of the way in which the process works in the United States. Because when I think about the death penalty, I don't think about the grand moral abstractions. I think about the question of whether or not our commitments to equal treatment under the law, to due process of the law, and to the avoidance of cruel punishment are and can be realized in the practices of our institutions. So from morality to law, uh, to the I American idea of the rule of law, to close observation of the way in which our institutions work, that's why I think that a course in the death penalty should be required of every Amherst student. All right. I Otherwise, I'm opposed to requirements. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, let me, as a backdrop for the first question, uh, let me just give you a little bit of statistics from the Pew Research Organization. Uh, in 2016, 20 inmates were executed in the United States. Uh, that is the lowest number in 40 years. Uh, five states accounted for all of those executions. Uh, Alabama, Florida, Georgia, Missouri, and Texas. Uh, the uh, same research poll also showed uh, that 49% of uh, the population favors the death penalty for people convicted of murder, while 42% oppose. Uh, also, in 2016, 34% of Democrats favored the death penalty, while 72% of Republicans favored the death penalty. So with that, let me pose the question, and uh, why don't I start with uh, maybe Sandy. Uh, 
who should decide whether there is a death penalty? Should it be left to the states? Should the federal government decide? Should the people decide? Should a governor be able to impose a moratorium? Whose decision should it be? Well, in our case, we had, as in the steps along the way, before I got involved, we did have a gubernatorial moratorium. Actually, there was, I think there was a bill that would have imposed a moratorium. The bill failed on the last hour, in the last hours of the last night of session. This, now, again, this is before 1908, 06, when I got involved. And then the governor did it by executive, well, he didn't, he, he did it by executive order. He said, I will not impose the death penalty. We're gonna do this study. So why is that okay for a, a single person to overrule the decision of the people, if you will? The governor has the power to do it, and we were trying to slowly progress towards repeal and a moratorium. I'm giving you a political answer, but a moratorium was what we felt was the first step to that end. And who's we? Well, the there's always been a coalition, uh, Catholic Church, and everybody else in the room. We, all of our meetings, we met every Monday during the 90-day session, and all of our meetings were in the Catholic Conference offices, and everybody in the room but the Catholic Conference people were pro-choice, you name it. So it was liberals plus the Catholic <clears throat> Church, which is very important when we get to the end of the process. Joe, do you want to tackle that one, or should we leave it oh, for... Yeah, in Illinois, there was a moratorium, but really what it amounts to is there's a constitutional provision that allows the governor wide, broad discretion in terms of granting clemency, and so Governor Ryan simply issued a stay saying he would not authorize any executions, and the reason was that there were some problems with the death penalty in terms of people that were later exonerated in Illinois had been on death row, and that always has interested me in terms of what we can do to, let's say, improve the death penalty. I don't mean improve it by using it more frequently, but making sure that we don't have innocent people facing death, for example, and some of the other problems. But if, you know, I'm sure that uh, the professors probably studied that the federal system has actually transformed and adopted statutes that correct some of those problems. One example is there's a criticism of the death penalty because the jurors think, well, if we don't imp impose death, then maybe this guy's going to get out of jail. But in the federal system, the jurors are always given the option of either death or life without parole, or they're not going to, they can't agree on any sentence in the, in, in, up to the judge, and the judge cannot impose either of those. The jury doesn't agree to either of those. So those are the kinds of fixes that I think that could come into place and could have come into place in Illinois. This was more before my time working for the state of Illinois. And then the legislature, as in Sandy's case, uh, uh, abolished the, the death penalty. I mean, the, the legislature obviously represented the people, so you can say the people should, should decide. I, of course, uh, you know, I'm enough of a populist to believe, yes, the people should decide. For the federal government, for the Eighth Amendment, it's ultimately going to be the, the uh, Supreme Court, and I think that we would probably all agree that that's not going to be changed in the next four years at least, probably longer. Yes. Yeah. So, um I think this is a very hard question, and it's one that the Supreme Court itself has grappled with, which is how do we understand what, quote, the people want? So one way to understand what the people want is to actually observe what happens when the death penalty is put on the ballot. And together with a, a group of four Amherst undergraduates, uh, I'm doing a project called When the Death Penalty Goes Public which is examining every time the death penalty has been put on the ballot in the United States since the beginning of the 20th century, since the start of the initiative and referendum process. And for abolitionists like Sandy, the news is not good. 34 times the death penalty has been put on the ballot in the United States, 31 times the abolition side is lost. And that's all over the country. So if that's your measure of what the people want, then at least over the course of the 20th century, uh, it looks like the people want to retain the death penalty. But I want to just suggest that there's another way of assessing what the people want, and that's what actually happens with the death penalty. And it's my view that the death penalty is dying in the United States. 
I was eager to be on this panel because a few years from now, we'll be talking about the death penalty as history in the United States. And again, I want to pick up on, well, I'll say that again. We're going to be talking about it. A pick up on what the judge said. If you look at what's happened to the death penalty in state after state, the death penalty is dying in the United States. Death sentencing is way down. Executions are way down. Public support <coughs> as measured by public opinion uh, is way down. Prosecutors are less wi willing to bring capital cases. Juries are less willing to convict in capital cases. So that's another way of trying to see what it is that the people actually want. And that's important to look at because what we know is that people's abstract views about the death penalty are one thing, but when they actually see the way the death penalty operates, they see its geographic bias, they see its class bias, they see its racial bias, they see its error rate, and they see the ways in which we've not yet been able to perfect the technology of execution, more and more Americans are saying, I may believe in the death penalty in the abstract, but I worry that the death penalty in the United States does more damage to the United States than it does good for the United States. All right, Joe, I think Joe wanted to say the, something the as well. The reduced use does not suggest necessarily that the people generally want to abolish the death penalty. The reduced use is a reflection of improvements in the way it is decided, an improvement in the selection of cases by the prosecutors, an improvement in the jury determination ultimately. So over time, there have been improvements that we've seen that's reduced the number of death penalty cases, it reduced the number of verdicts in the death penalty cases. But I don't think that you can, you can use those statistics to say, oh, that's because the people want to abolish it. Sandy. Our polling consistently showed that if you asked, do you, do you support repeal if it is to be replaced by life without the possibility of parole, that the public support for repeal went above 50% in Maryland, which is a blue state, okay? One of our greatest concerns as the vote neared was that there would be a case that was just the facts would be terrible, no question about guilt, and so on. And there was such a case, and the jury in the Eastern Shore, not Baltimore City, not Prince George's County, that the jury voted not to impose a death penalty. So. We built. We were able to build on that. In well, way the jury worked. It worked. The jury system worked. So and then you abolished it. Um, let me let me move on for to sort of another twist on the death penalty. One of the criticisms has been that the some innocent folks could actually suffer the death penalty. What if you modified the way we imposed the death penalty to uh, instead of the reasonable doubt standard, which is the standard criminal liability standard? Uh, to a no doubt standard for death penalty. So, and I'm not exactly sure what it would look like, but we could probably figure it out. Uh, something where you have DNA uh, or some forensic evidence that there is really uh, plus a confession, plus, you know, just to be able to do a no doubt standard, would that change whether or not the death penalty is appropriate? We felt you can't draw a line. You ha this is an absolute. Uh, when the bill first got to the floor two years before, we did pass it. There was a floor amendment that said you have to have DNA evidence or other biological evidence, uh, and that's killed the bill. Well, that passed, but it killed repeal. But our view was you can't draw a line that, for whatever reason, whether it's the ethical, race, resources, you still have those concerns, even if you don't have the concern even you ta assume that you no longer have the concern of the states killing an innocent person. As a former prosecutor, I, I think there really is already a no doubt standard. I mean, as, uh, you don't sit in front of the jury and say, you know, there may be some doubts here, but they're not reasonable. That's not an argument you make. In McVeigh case, for example, they wouldn't have made it. There was no doubt about his guilt. So I don't think that there, the no doubt is an issue for the guilt or innocence. It can be reasonable doubt. Good prosecutors are going to say, jurors, if you have any doubts, reasonable or not, acquit this person. 
But the question would be moving into the death penalty phase. You know, death penalty trials are bifurcated. They have guilt phase and then the penalty phase. And I suppose you could adopt various standards for the penalty phase that would make it more difficult. Now, bear in mind, you have to have aggravating factors. You have to have unanimity among the jurors. So there are features in the death penalty phase that make it pretty tough anyway. Um, could you, at some point, at, at a level there, just make it more difficult so we could be sure we never have one of these people that is innocent face the death penalty? You know, I think that's, I mean, we haven't heard about any recent uh, exonerations, but it shouldn't happen even in cases involving, uh, you know, car theft and things of that sort. So uh, we should not be convicting innocent people. How about that? We have unanimity on that one. Everybody agree? Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, Professor Sarrett, are there any um, tweaks in the death penalty procedure that <laughs> you feel would uh, take care of the issue of cruel and unusual punishment? Um, and it, both how it's meted out, how it's imposed, that uh, would alleviate what you see as uh, the cruel and unusual punishment provided by the Eighth Amendment? In my view, the death penalty is broken <coughs> thoroughly. Uh, it's broken at the guilt phase. Uh, we know that innocent people have been convicted in the guilt phase. It's broken at the sentencing <coughs> phase we know that the race of the victim, everything else to the contrary notwithstanding, plays a very large role in, role in death sentencing. We know that it's broken at the punishment phase because of the reality of botched executions. There's a wonderful book that I recommend that you read called Gruesome Spectacles, Botched Executions and America's Death Penalty. It makes great Father's Day giving. <laughs> in which a group of Amherst undergraduates looked at every American execution from 1890 to 2010. 3% of those executions were botched, meaning a failure to fo follow the legal protocol or standard operating procedure. The highest rate of botched executions was of lethal injection. 7% of lethal injections were botched. And remember, the definition of botched is does not follow the legal protocol or standard operating procedure. And this study ended before the difficulties that we've seen with lethal injection since 2014. Could you come up with a fix that would guarantee that no innocent person would be convicted in a death case? I don't believe that you can. Could you come up with a fix that would guarantee that the race of the victim would not play a role in the sentencing in capital cases? And could you come up with a method of execution that is foolproof? I don't believe that you can. Can reforms be instituted that make the death penalty less troublesome to American values? Surely they can be. But at the end of the day, the question is, can we have a death penalty system that is compatible with our commitments to equal treatment under the law to due process of the law and to the avoidance of cruel and unusual punishment, I don't think we can. Uh, so piggy, piggybacking off of that, if, if it really is a moral question about whether the state should be imposing death or not, which it sounds like regardless of what we can do to fix the system, it still questions our sense of morality, why is that different than, say, killing Osama bin Laden overseas without any due process? Or, or why is it any different than killing an active shooter? The state kills active shooters, that's in the Pulse nightclub situation. Or in the Dallas situation, the guy that was in the parking lot and, and killed five police officers. I think if there had been sharpshooters on the top of the Murrah building and saw Timothy McVeigh and had forewarning that, that he was going to light the fuse on the bomb truck, that they would have been fully authorized to execute him right then and there. Uh, there wasn't knowledge of that. but. The state kills in a variety of situations. Obviously, war, we don't love it, we don't like it, we'd like to prevent it, but the state kills in that situation. They kill with active shooters, and they do kill where we have deliberation and a death penalty. Okay. Uh, pr pr anybody want to tackle that, and then I'm going to open it up for questions. Well, I have a photo in my office when uh, John Paul II came to Baltimore. He first preached it. 
the baseball stadium. And then he went to our daily bread uh, for daily for the for the poor and and the homeless and so on. And then he was walking in an alley. And I have a the Catholic Church gave me a conference gave me a picture of the Pope in the alley, like Jesus, among the poor, with the cardinal next to him, his secretary, surrounded by suits, and those guys didn't have rosaries, they had guns. And then you see across the street is the Enoch Pratt Central Library, which is across from the main basilica, the first diocese in the country. And as I say to people, you see those two people on the roof? They're not there to take out books. <laughs> they, were, they were sharpshooters. And this is the first time I've had to think about the death penalty in that setting of, I'm sure those sharpshooters were not told to shoot to wound right. if somebody had attacked the pope. So I don't know how to answer that. May I just say, you don't have to be a pacifist to be opposed to the death penalty. So the standard in, in self-defense cases is a necessity standard. Is it necessary? Is there any alternative to this? And if there is an alternative to it, traditionally the law had said, use that alternative. Some of us think that ought to be the standard for war. Not no war, but if we're going to go to war, it's going to have to meet a very high bar, and that's the standard of necessity. The question about the death penalty is, is it necessary for the United States to have a death penalty? To preserve innocent life, I don't believe there's any reliable evidence that the death penalty deters any more than life in prison without parole. Is it necessary to have a death penalty to vindicate American values and commitments? I don't believe it is. So I think you can say war is sometimes justifiable, Self-defense is sometimes justifiable and still reach the empirical conclusion that the United States would be better off if it joined every other constitutional democracy in the world and eliminated the death penalty. Now, there is an abolitionist dilemma, as was mentioned earlier. The way to end the death penalty is to embrace life imprisonment without parole. And life imprisonment without parole expresses the same idea, which is the state can always get it right, and human beings cannot be redeemed, transformed, and made better. But that's what we've got to do to end the death penalty. And that's what I call an abolitionist dilemma. All right, do we have questions? I'm going to have you speak into the microphone. Sandy, thank you. What is the penalty for a lifer, a real lifer, who commits murder in prison? Same question to Austin. Well, you would get life without the possibility of parole. That is very, very rare that that does take place. Uh, we had a prison guard, a former prison guard, testify on the steps that can be taken by the prison, guard, prison officials to minimize that risk. But again, there is that risk, but you have to make a decision that overall it's not, that exception does not justify maintaining the death penalty. So I'm a physician and I'd like to ask you a personal question. I, like the physicians in the room, have had the opportunity to witness death. And it's an awesome responsibility. It's a powerful experience. And my question, or maybe my challenge is, can you have an opinion about the death penalty without actually having witnessed an execution and talked to the person beforehand and seen the body afterwards and understand what it means and how it affects you personally and then whether um, you're still prepared to have the opinions that you hold? Well, I, guess I would say, in the legislative process, our opinions and then the decisions and the votes we cast are informed by the knowledge of people who know more than we do. And so hearing testimony from physicians on what death means is a viable, perhaps essential part 
of our decision, should be an essential part of our decision making process. Because we deal with a host of issues, so we're not experts on hardly anything. So inform our decision. Could, could, could I just say, um, uh, I, I find that a, a, a really hard and very productive question. And I find it a hard and productive question because that question could be asked about anything. I think the Holocaust was bad, but it's not based on seeing it in action. I think airplane crashes ought to be avoided, but God willing, I'm not going to have that experience. And what you said, you see, leads me to what I started with. I love that question because that's the kind of question that I want Amherst undergraduates to grapple with. How do I know? What produces reliable knowledge? At what point, I loved your, que loved your question. <laughs> uh, my grandfather, who was a carpenter, used to ask me that question all the time. He accused me of being in love with what he called book learning. And he said, Austin, until you've had the experience, you're not, enti you're not entitled to have opinions. So I've resisted my grandfather and made a career in the academy, and I'm not quite ready to give it up. <laughs> Joe, um, as you know better than any of us, prosecutors and defense lawyers talk about the reasons for punishment as being retribution, individual deterrence, general deterrence, perhaps other purposes. I'm interested, because I don't think we've heard, what, what are your thoughts about why it's necessary to follow up on what the professor said? I, I'm familiar with those categories that, the, that are always used at sentencing. I think in the McVeigh case, there was a feeling of fundamental fairness. We argued in the death penalty phase that it seemed unbelievably unfair for McVeigh, who was a fan of the Buffalo Bills, he grew up near Buffalo, to be able for the rest of his life to enjoy the victories and the defeats of the Buffalo Bills, to follow the news, to read books, to write letters, to do all the various things that he had deprived 19 young children, many parents, grandparents, you know, 168 other people of doing. It just seemed unfair for him to take that many lives and deprive so many others of that level of joy. So, you know, I can't really answer the question of, of general deterrence. Uh, you know, I think that the statistics probably are never going to be able to prove whether or not the death penalty deters people. Of course, we've seen most of the terrorists in recent years uh, aren't deterred by the death penalty because they're suicidal. So that eliminates that specific deterrence. I mean, it sure as heck stopped McVeigh from writing any kind of manifesto and having it published. There was some specific deterrence, Lee, if that answers your question. We have a question. Hi. Um, for those of us who uh, disagree with executing someone like Timothy McVeigh, I would really question your ethics and your morals, because I do support this idea of a retribution for, for what he had done. Now, more importantly, I am a physician also. Um, to say that there's no easy way to execute somebody is patently ridiculous. How many people die of overdoses every day? All you need to do is overdose somebody. And then, of course, some may remember the guillotine. That works very well. So does a firing squad. So there are ways of finding um, painless, shall we say, ways of executing somebody. So, that's so I, I, think that, I think that question was addressed to me. Um, <laughs> was, that a, the question? was that a question? So uh, I think that, and th this is where the conversation about the death penalty uh, sometimes kind of leaves me high and dry. Uh, I'm not interested in the abstract question about uh, what the death penalty might be. I'm interested in the practical question of what the death penalty is. So if you look at death penalty protocols, 
for lethal injection. They're not designed to individualize the dosage to the body mass index of the condemned. Could they be? Sure, in some abstract world, they could be. Could the United States use the guillotine? Which, by the way, was not a perfect technology for execution. It didn't work all the time. Could we use the firing squad? Not a pet perfect technology. So in the abstract, I'm not arguing that we couldn't find some painless way of killing. I'm arguing that we can't find a way of killing that is foolproof. And again, I'm not a doctor, but I'm very nervous. So I read a lot about medical error. And that's what I worry about. Um, so just to go back, I, I agree philosophically, there should not be a death penalty, but to go back to the very first question you posed, which was, you know, you start by saying, what does it mean to not give someone something that they deserve? Yeah. But just by posing that question and then by everything you said, you've already answered it. Yeah. So how do you keep that as a question that's alive when you're engaging your students, Good. when you've already Good. sort of answered it? Good. Well, again, um, mostly, and you know, mostly my students don't know what I think. <laughs> I'm not a proselytizer against the death penalty. Not in the classroom. What I say to my students is you're not entitled to know what I think until you buy my books. <laughs> uh, and, no, I take this very seriously. My deepest commitment, which I'm sure I do not realize, is to respecting what my students think, not to converting them to agree with me. So when I'm in a classroom talking about the death penalty, I am trying my best to articulate the most compelling reasons for its maintenance. And when I ask a student, what does it mean for someone to deserve something, that is not designed to lead them to the conclusion that you can embrace deservedness or retribution as a theory of punishment and then you must, at some day, reject the death penalty. If Amherst stands for anything, I believe it stands for the proposition that our job is to help students develop their own views, understand the difference between an argument and an opinion, use evidence well, write well, and go off into the world to do good. And by the way, I am changing your grades. <laughs> the arguments against the death penalty are all great and good and true, uh, but the alternative is, as you've said, you know, long-term imprisonment or maybe lifetime imprisonment. Uh, if you have known even one long-term prisoner, uh, you know that it's a life of intermittent, even in the United States, physical torture and unrelenting mental torture. If I were a governor and the condemned prisoner asked me for lifetime imprisonment, I would argue on humane grounds, please choose to be dead, it is much better. And if insisted, maybe I would reluctantly grant the petition, but it would be on humane grounds with great reluctance. If I were Jehovah, I would freeze hell over and extinguish the souls of the damned. Was there a question? <laughs> the, uh... Actually, I have a question, uh, Professor Sarad. If an inmate does ask who's on death row wants to be killed, which has happened in Oregon, uh, instead of waiting for appeals, um, is that morally wrong or should the governor allow it? I don't think, um, and I guess this goes to what punishment is, I, I don't think that uh, any particular person who's being punished should be allowed to decide what that punishment will be. And I especially don't believe that people who are on death row in long-term confinement under conditions which in many states are draconian uh, should be allowed to volunteer uh, to be executed. That's not their decision. That's our decision. Okay. So um, with that, I think we're going to start to wrap it up. We have five minutes. Um, so I'm going to give each of the uh, speakers about a two-minute 
brief, uh, so we're going to Joe, did you want to go first or last? I took more than uh, five minutes, so I'm going to take way less than two minutes. I just want to thank you all for being so polite. But I particularly want to thank my colleagues here for not eviscerating me. <laughs> Sandy? Uh, there is a statue of Thurgood Marshall outside the State House in Annapolis. Thurgood Marshall, who grew up in Baltimore, who grew up on Drude Hill Avenue. My grandmother grew up on McCullough Street, two parallel streets at the turn of the century when they were there. One was for whites and one was for blacks. And so when I spoke on the floor when the day we repealed the bill, I said to everyone, we've all walked past that Thurgood Marshall statue today. And Behind Marshall was the site of the building where he argued death penalty cases as a Maryland lawyer before he went on to the NAACP Legal Defense Fund. I did not mention that on the other side, as part of the tableau of the Marshall statue, were two kids representing Brown versus the board, which obviously Marshall brought. And then there was another statue of a young man named uh, Donald Gaines Murray, on whose behalf Marshall began the legal framework, the succession of cases that led to Brown by arguing that denying an African-American Donald Gaines Murray admission to the University of Maryland Law School, which had rejected Marshall, was unconstitutional. Can anybody guess where Donald Gaines Murray went to college? Right here. I didn't mention that on the floor because I would have lost it. Okay. But the process, we passed the bill that day and then there was an effort to petition it to referendum. It so happened that we don't make it easy to petition our work to referendum because we think we do a good job. So it's, you have to put a certain number of signatures in by a certain date. And the date, that deadline, I was on campus. We didn't think they'd, have the, they'd make it, that the opponents would have enough signatures. Reporter called me that morning. I said, I am not talking to you until we know for sure that this effort is resolved. I was in Stern Auditorium when I got an email from one of the people on our side who said, they don't have it. It's over. We've won. I walked across the quad, walked into this chapel, knowing that Tony Marks had recently put the portrait of Charles Hamilton Houston, yes sir, up there, also an Amherst grad, and Thurgood Marshall's mentor, that that was now hanging in Johnson Chapel. I walked into the building, looked around, didn't see it initially, but then I saw that it wasn't there, it's where Richard Wilbur's portrait is now, and I went up to that balcony and I leaned over and I touched that frame, which for me was as if I was touching the Western Wall in Jerusalem and made that connection between the effort that had just successfully ended. Thank you. Thank you. Last, last word goes to Professor so Sarah. I, I, wanna, I wanna end where I started. I wanna talk just about uh, about Amherst. Uh, as much as I care about the end of the death penalty, my real, I'm not an advocacy academic. My real commitment is to education. Uh, the, the world, the death penalty can be here and the world can go on. The world can't go on very well if we don't get education right. And I just want to say, I've been at Amherst for 42 years. And it is one of the great privileges of my life to be a member of this community, and I want to say why. Amherst today, I believe, exemplifies much of what American higher education should be. And that is an education which is demanding, challenging, and stretches our students every day, in which they learn to write well, speak without using the word like after every other word, reason clearly, 
evaluate evidence. But Amherst has always stood for something beyond rigor, which I hope you've all experienced. And that is, this is a community that cares for and cares about the people who come here. So Amherst challenges its students, pushes them, but it also cares for and cares about them. And how do I know that's true? Because I go to alumni events and I see and hear the commitment of the alums. Even when, as usual, you get most things wrong. <laughs> You love the place, and we benefit from that love. And I think much of that love is because you experienced not just the rigor and challenge, but the fact that this institution cares for and cares about the people who are within the community. So thank you for your love for Amherst. All right. Thank you all for coming.